I'll go through a kind of a bullet point system to engage in conversation. Uh, and I'll depart, I'll have two departures and three points. Uh, first departure, uh, of course, with due respect, Madeleine Albright told us Joe Biden brought US back to multilateralism. That's right. Uh, I would say that Europeans, and especially uh, continental Europeans, to qualify, notice that he also brought China with him to multilateralism. Uh, the G7 was supposed to be centered about China, China-centric. The, the G7 announced a countermeasure to BRI without giving much details. Uh, and the European leaders were slightly wary of that. Emmanuel Macron himself said that uh, Europe doesn't, and, and France, sorry, doesn't want to be vassalized by China, but it doesn't want either to uh, align with the US on the Chinese question. That was pretty kind of uh, an outstatement just straight after the, the G7. Then NATO was again on China, most likely, and this would be a surprising uh, uh, issue for everyone who was here last year at, at CIMI because we were lucky to engage with the Secretary, Deputy Secretary General of NATO at that time. He shared some um, elements of the new policy, new position of NATO. This was much about Russia. This was much about uh, cyber wars and etc. Not really about China. And uh, NATO was, was this year, the summit was a lot about China. Emmanuel Macron, again, you'll tell me again French, uh, said that according to him, China is a very important uh, security issue, not denying that, but that China is not exactly in the geography of the North Atlantic and should be discussed differently. And then came the US-EU summit, which again was, uh, was about China. So, broad fact, uh, Joe Biden brought back the US to uh, multilateralism, but with this uh, a Chinese topic and which Mark was qualified to be a Chinese ideology. And the first kind of answer from uh, Europe was kind of not going with the, with the ideology. I should mention that um, some uh, important uh, leaders in Germany also mentioned that Germany ought to have its own, uh, its own um, policy on China. The, the German and the European industry and especially the European uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Beijing has been extremely vocal, Georg Wutke, uh, since then, on, on trying to keep an economic policy which is independent from, from the US. So there is definitely a new elephant in the room uh, between the US and, uh, and the EU, and yes, it is China. No, which scope should it be treated? We don't know, but uh, it's not, we're far from aligned, the two, uh, EU, the EU is not uh, aligned with uh, this extravert uh, China, uh, extravert US, sorry, bringing China on the table. The second departure is from, from Marcos uh, very quickly. You mentioned that uh, the US is in an introspective moment at the, the domestic side. Well, I would say that the Europeans, in a sense, had expected that, they, they had anticipated, of course, that the Chinese policy of the Trump administration would be in the continuity and maybe even more in enforcement and, and, and in strengthening the, the, the policy of, uh, of Trump, making it more systematic just beyond tractations in, 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 in trade. But European leaders would have anticipated or expected that the domestic agenda that's setting democracy back to work, that's setting the social agenda back to kind of bright prospect in, in, the, in the US itself at domestic level would have come first, and then that, that trying to engage with the rest of the world or to bring the allies into an ideology against China would have come uh, later. So not saying again that these questions are not real questions, that they are not serious questions, but there is a feel in Europe that uh, the three levels that Kevin Rudd mentioned this morning are kind of entangled, where they ought to be more disentangled in terms of uh, spaces where to treat them, multilateral, not multilateral, regional, which region, maybe the Quad, by the way, even the French have a, an Indo-Pacific uh, policy already on the military, military level and they are developing one uh, on the economic level. And time frame. So 
this uh, is where we stand uh, so far in, the, I would say, the EU reception on, on the US, um, well, the word was said by, by someone very knowledgeable on that, on the, on the US uh, ideology on China. My three last points are, are, ve are very quick. Uh, is it not a problem rather on uh, dealing with uh, technology? Sorry, my last point, my third point. After all, we're not surprised that there's a rivalry between China and the US, especially it's something that we observers of China and the US-China uh, relations had observed since 2012. Since 2012, there was already uh, the annual report of the State Department mentioning the technological threat uh, in the matter of dual technologies, that is, those civilian technologies that can also serve the military. One can read, maybe it's a scholarly exercise, maybe it's a diplomatic exercise, I believe it's a, it's a, it's a strategic exercise to reread all the uh, recent history between the US and, uh, and, uh, and China in, in two ways. One, the technological uh, bottom, uh, the underwave, which uh, has seen sometimes a greater disparity in, in different technologies, the race accelerating, and in some areas like supercomputers, uh, China going ahead more often in the year than, than, than the US does. That would be one trend. But the second trend, again, is ideology. And in fact, who started with ideology? It's interesting to see that China started with ideology. And we are at a stage today where if we compare those two trends, there is one striking question. And back to Europe, this is the question Europe has on US uh, current ideology uh, with China. The question is whether we are not in a situation where, on the one hand, clearly China underestimates the US. China underestimates democracies. China has observed that democracies are facing crisis. China has observed that the EU as a whole cannot always coordinate. China has observed what happened under the Trump administration and what happened uh, on, on January, uh, in, 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 uh, in January on the Capitol Hill. But that does not mean that democracies are over. And observers, and this is a discussion we had with, with Marcos uh, uh, before, before the, the seven, understand that China today underestimates the resilience of democracy and they don't understand, structurally don't understand that crisis is at the core of the process of democracy. But on the other hand, many technologists, many um, military people, uh, many diplomats uh, tend to think that the US overestimates China. That first of all, we overestimate that the US overestimate China in the short run because in the short run, they don't have the military projection. They don't have such a lead in uh, numerous enough uh, technologies where uh, the West could not have a lead uh, in the future and uh, get back to, to some delay in those limited areas where there is a delay. And in the mid to long term, the West definitely underestimates the socio-demographic issues uh, in China and the uh, local environment. No, I'm not talking about global emission, global uh, energy, uh, sorry, global uh, emission, uh, global gases, um, global emissions, sorry, thank you, uh, but about the local, the local environment. So on those two fronts, short term, mid term, we might be overestimating the, the, the portarian, you know, the innovative transformation of China, uh, model the dream of Xi Jinping. When we see Beijing, maybe, when we see Shanghai, uh, maybe some other cities, but really not at, at the core of the, of the country. So where we stand today is in this wrong start in conversation, maybe, uh, I would say that Europe is not, and this is my concluding remark, maybe not surprised that uh, America is bullish or extraverted. Even having said that uh, Europeans feel it's come too early and maybe not in the right uh, formats, in the right places, uh, there, is a way, there is a way to work on that. And I think there are ways to work on that through technology. And the US-EU uh, summit had one interesting element, which is the Transatlantic Technology Council, uh, which got announced. 
uh, and which will be about organizing technology transfers and etc. But that calls for real, balanced, uh, real balanced uh, uh, negotiation. And if the U.S. wants uh, the European industry, whose lobby are extremely important in Brussels, to slightly disengage or to measure their engagement with China on the economic front, the U.S. industry will have to give guarantees. And it's far from being an easy topic because in some technologies, European industry is leading ahead of the U.S. industry. So, in a nutshell, this extraverted position is not really convincing uh, from the European point of view, but it's also a good uh, point to start to, 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 to give a frame, to give uh, some pressure on the EU to, to build itself and to, to keep its agenda of, uh, of uh, communitarian construction going ahead.